This is a long one, so buckle up. Fold those tray tables and put your seats in the upright position. I was a flight attendant 20 years ago. The flight that made me quit was from South Bend, Indiana to Minneapolis. It started out with a funny story of having an adult star on our little regional flight. 50 seat CRJ, I was the only flight attendant. I got a chuckle of how amped the gate agent was about it. He was obviously a fan. Anyways, everything else was normal other than it not being a very full flight. We take off and I'm in the jump seat, chilling and waiting for the first ding to tell me we're out of sterile cockpit over 10,000 feet high when the vibration system suddenly kicks on. It was then that my oh shit reflexes kicked in because all I can smell is burning though there isn't any smoky haze. For a hot minute, I thought I was imagining it, but when I looked up, one of the passengers in front of me makes eye contact and gives me a look that confirms I'm not the only one smelling it. No one else notices. Again, it was odd, but the first three rows were vacant since the flight was only half full. So for the first time ever, I reached up and grabbed the phone to the cockpit and hit the emergency button, which alerts the cockpit but not any of the passengers, unless they know what the flashing light means above my head. The captain answers, and it sounds like he's Darth Vader, since the two of them have their oxygen masks on. I said quietly into the phone, what the fuck is happening? They tell me they don't know, and they need me to get up and check behind the galley cart, the lavatory, and then pull up to the hatch to the avionics bay since they can't figure out where it's coming from, and there aren't any alarms going off. Apparently air traffic control couldn't see from the ground if we were on fire either. So I try to as calmly as I can move through the cabin without making any sort of scene, even though I am pretty much thinking we're all going to die at this point, and my throat is burning from breathing in the fumes. Again, no one noticed, and I'm grateful seeing as the three of us crew members were on the same, we're going to die wavelength. Literally nobody even batted an eyelash at me crawling on the floor and pulling up the hatch to the avionics bay. I still have no idea how no one thought that was out of the ordinary. So there was nothing that I could see on my side, no visible fire or smoke. I call back to the cockpit, and they say that thankfully they're going to let us land and that while we wait for clearance, they're going to vent the cabin to clear some of the fumes. At this point, I buckle myself back into the jump seat and try not to look freaked out as I face the 25 souls in the seats in front of me. As the captain announces to the aircraft that there are fumes and we need to vent them as we need to get back to the airport due to mechanical issues. Yeah, blank stares are aimed in my direction and I just smile and nod as if this is standard procedure. None of this is standard. So the venting is supposed to feel like a little puff of air next to your ears, but it felt like one of those air cannons punching you in the side of your face, which was just delightful. But soon after, we were on the ground safely, and I get to work, getting everyone off this missile to hell, so I can have my own freakout moment in private. The two pilots and myself wind up chain-smoking out in front of the airport and not speaking to each other for about a half an hour. What caused all of this was that the engine had been washed out that morning at the maintenance bay, but it was not rinsed or ran properly to let the chemicals burn off or rinse out. That was what was causing the fumes. An hour later, we were back on the same aircraft and flew back to Minneapolis without issue. I quit the week after. The second scary encounter being a flight attendant was hearing the warning messages to the captain during takeoff once. Imagine being in the jump seat and hearing right behind you, winds here, winds here, pull up, pull up, while trying to act like everything is cool. I hated that airline so damn much. My best friend at school and I used to go over to one another's home often. His family was always really welcoming and nice to me. I was encouraged to turn up whenever I felt like it. 
On occasion, I would turn up, and my friend wouldn't be there, but his mom would be like, Oh hey, come on in, it's great to see you. Why don't you hang out here for a bit? I just have to do a little bit of shopping. So could you keep an eye on the place? There's snacks in the fridge. My friend's mom and my mom were very close, so we had a great relationship between our families. I would often stay home for her if no one was home. This experience takes place when I was asked by my mom to go over to my friend's house with some vegetables our grandmother grew in her garden. It was about lunchtime when I headed over. I pressed the doorbell to their home, but no one came to the door. I guessed that no one was in. That was fine, because I was entrusted with the location of their spare key. They hid it in case of emergencies. On times like this, when they were out, and I was sent to return something, I knew to leave it on their living room table, and lock up and return the key where I found it. It was pretty routine. So I took the key out and unlocked the door and headed inside. As soon as I got inside, I sensed the presence of someone in the house with me. I instantly knew that there was someone upstairs. I don't know, I guess I heard a noise or something. I thought, this is out of the ordinary. Someone should be down here, and it was Sunday after all. I guessed that my friend or his mom was upstairs, perhaps ill, and then I somehow convinced myself that one of them had collapsed or something. So I set the bag of vegetables down in the entryway, and then headed in and upstairs. I thought that there could be a thief or an intruder up there, so I did my best attempt of being one with the shadows. In my mind, I moved as silently as a ninja. I was a kid, so lay off. Let me just explain the upstairs floor plan. If you're upstairs, from the back, there's a storage room, my friend's room and the toilet, and then my friend's mom's room. If you were to crane your head from the stairs, you'd pretty much see and hear anything that's going on up there. When I stealthily got to the top of the stairs, I didn't look because I heard some strange sound. It's like a pa, pa, pa sound. Maybe it was an air leak, like the sound of a tire being deflated. It was really weird. I heard the sound then travel across the hall towards my friend's room. I thought, oh man. There's something weird going on here. I don't think that it's my friend or his mom making that noise. I just climbed the rest of the stairs and headed towards my friend's room. I was careless or brave, but it happened. I craned my head around the door frame and I saw a man in his room. He was spitting on the floor. That was the source of the sound. It was incredibly gross. I was completely lost for words. It was like I was dreaming. He spun around and looked my way. He didn't seem at all surprised by my presence. He even gave me a cheerful greeting. Oh, hello. I felt awkward enough to respond. Oh, hi. That's all I could muster up. I was still very confused. A few seconds or so crawled by, and then I asked, What are you doing? Oh, just keeping my ex in her place, showing her who's boss. This is how you do it. I looked around my friend's room, and his toys, his dresser, his chest of drawers, and his clothes and his wardrobe were covered in this man's spit. I was stunned. There was someone who was completely out of their mind stood there in my friend's bedroom. A thought jumped into my mind. Get the police. I ran downstairs and grabbed my grandmother's vegetables and ran to the police station. Three officers accompanied me back to my friend's house. They headed upstairs, but they said that they couldn't find anyone in the house. My friend and his mom, who'd been out, arrived back to their home to be greeted by the flashing lights of a police car and officers holding notebooks. By the time they'd heard my story and heard from the officers, they were both in tears. It turns out that the man I had seen in my friend's bedroom spitting on everything was my friend's dad. Apparently he'd been searching for my friend's home after he got divorced from his wife. I have never met someone with that much malice. I never thought that an adult would do that to their own flesh and blood. Well, my friend's mom said to her son, we will throw out everything he spat on. 
My friend reacted at first with anger. He actually had to be restrained by an understanding officer. I helped calm him down, and I'm not ashamed to say that I had tears in my eyes too. My family gave some money to my friend's mom. His dad even spat on his underwear. Can you believe that? We wanted to help, but not pity. The money we gave them was given out of love, not obligation, righteousness, or sympathy. There are decent people out in the world, and I personally would never let that bastard's actions cloud my impression of those who do good out there. This is why the story is so hard to share. There's no lesson, there's nothing to be garnered, except from disappointment in the man who committed those foul deeds in his ex-wife's empty house. My dad and my brother took turns in picking my friend and his mom up from work and school and dropping them off. I was too young for a license. The police let their intentions be known too. My friend's dad never came back. My friend has an older sister, and we all think she's being stalked. It's ongoing, but I want to share what's happening currently. My friend's sister has been staying with my friend for a while now to get away from it all and repel her stalker. She said it's like living in a nightmare. I wanted to do something nice for her, so I offered to take them both out for dinner to take their minds off of things. We sat down to dinner, and things were going well until I saw my friend's sister's face drop. She began to tremble. I felt bad for asking them to come out. Maybe it was too soon. Then she muttered. He sat behind me. I looked behind her, and I saw an old man with an unnaturally creepy smile. He was peering towards our table. He made me feel nauseous. He was just gross. He was the stalker. My friend had seen this guy following her sister before, so we were beyond it being a coincidence or a case of paranoia. My friend had had enough. She stood up and went over to his table and said loudly, If you don't stop following my sister, then I'm going to the police. A few tables of people looked over, but the old man just sat there smiling that insane smile. After a few moments, he got up and stepped away from his table and left. His expression didn't change, he just kept smiling. We thought that that bit of public embarrassment might be enough to put the creep off and make him leave my friend's sister alone. We were convinced it would work, and it turned out to be a correct prediction. Over the coming days, we would all joke about how easy it was. Everything came to a standstill for her sister, and a sense of normality was resumed in her life. However, just as soon as it ended, it seemed to start again. This time, the old man's target of torment was different. This time he was stalking my friend and not her sister, and he was a little more cunning in the method of stalking this time around. The old man began to haunt her life. He would just appear any place she went, but always at a distance or appearing inconspicuous. I will give you some examples. If she was out taking a walk or simply heading home, the old man would appear on his bike riding towards her or from behind her. He would smile that creepy smile of his as he passed her by. He would be there during rush hour in the subway where crowds are gathered. It made her feel as if she had no escape from him. In places where it was difficult to move or get away quickly, she'd see that weirdo and his smile. Enough was enough. My friend went to the police. Unfortunately, they weren't able to help. They said that because he actually hasn't done anything except smile at her and her sister, they couldn't do anything. She left the station frustrated and with a feeling of vulnerability. The old man and his behavior got worse. He was everywhere. She thought that the police might have been able to intervene when she saw him at college on campus, but again... They weren't able to help or offer any kind of protection. To the untrained eye, he was just an old man who was walking around smiling. What's the harm in that? She tried to mobilize all of her friends to help to discourage his behavior, 
but to our surprise, some of her friends didn't believe her. They said she was grasping at straws. She must have felt quite alone at the time. I believed her though. I had first-hand experience. I saw that creep with my own eyes. Plus, anyone who knew my friend well enough would say she's far from a liar or an exaggerator. It was helpless. Every day she grew more nervous and worn down, and every day the old man just smiled at her. He never did anything, he just watched her and smiled. She eventually dropped out of college and has grown less and less responsive to my calls and messages. I haven't really heard from her lately, and it's really worrying me. I feel as if we are right on the edge of something happening. Maybe I should speak up and yell at him like she did for her sister. But if I did that, wouldn't he just start stalking me? I don't know. Recently, I got in contact with her sister, and I asked how she's doing. She thought that she was just wrapped up with studies. She didn't know what had been going on. I don't know what will come of this, but I'm hoping she's just laying low for a while. I hope that creep hasn't escalated his stalking. This was a horrible thing to experience. It happened when I was running late. I finished work later than I wanted to that night, so I was rushing home through the neon-lit downtown area of my city. I saw something as I was rushing that made me stop in my tracks. There was a little girl in one of the alleyways. She must have only been about eight or nine years old. This part of the city at this time of night was no place for a girl of her age. I thought to myself as I looked her way. I noticed that she was stood in an alleyway next to a well-established gentleman's club. Stripping and much more went on in there, so I'm told. Anyway, she shouldn't have been there. I was a little worried for her. She was wearing a red school bag and it looked to be filled to the brim. It looked quite the burden for the little girl to be carrying. I wondered if she'd gotten herself lost. She began to head further into the alley, and I went after her. I didn't need to second-guess myself. I had to find out if she was alright. She was walking in the darkness of the alley all alone. Her head was down. Is everything alright? Is your mother nearby? I asked tentatively. She said nothing, just shook her head to indicate no. How about your dad? Is he around? Her face looked as if it turned to stone in that moment. He's so far away. What the hell, I thought to myself. The little girl turned around and started heading off further into the alley. I reached out to stop her, and I ended up grabbing her by her bag. I must have caught a clasp or a clip on her bag, because before I knew it, the contents of her bag spill out and cascade onto the floor. In her bag, amongst her textbooks, was a large transparent bag of white powder. No way. I heard myself mutter softly. I called the cops. I had to. Something wasn't right here, and I was really worried about the girl and why she had what looked like to be drugs in her bag. I heard from the police afterwards, and it turns out that the young girl was being forced to work as a drug courier by her stepdad. He was apparently part of the Yakuza. Her biological father was in prison, and her mother had deserted her and left her with the gangster years ago. Her stepfather was arrested, and the girl was taken into care. The officer mentioned that she will likely go to an orphanage. I hope she's doing well and is happy. To think that three adults let her down so terribly really puts a knot in my stomach. I really feel for that girl. No childhood should involve being a drugs mule. This world can be so cruel sometimes. I work overnights at a 24-hour diner. You can probably guess what company. I'm used to weird people and odd things happening but tonight was too much. 
The restaurant backs up to a field that has a tree line, and my cook and I went out back to smoke. We could hear someone yelling in the distance, but we get a lot of homeless people that come through town that are usually harmless, so we just shrugged it off as weird and went back inside. Later I came out again to smoke and throw away some trash in the dumpster that's next to the field. It was stupid to go over to it, but I hadn't heard that scream again. As I'm walking away from the dumpster, I hear, Hey, come here. Hey, come here. It was much closer than when we heard this person screaming for the first time. I went inside and got my co-worker, who owns a car with a spotlight on it. We shined it out into the field, which again, not smart, and we know that, but we couldn't see where he was. But the guy kept saying, Hey girl, come here. I called the cops by this point, because it was just too weird. As soon as I get off the phone with them, this guy comes walking out of the field. He's an older man wearing a tan trench coat, and my co-worker and a customer ran back inside because this guy was hauling ass across the parking lot. He started to come towards the door, and I called the cops again. My cook cut him off and told him he needed to go. The man was acting erratically, yelling at my cook and said, I'll end your life the next time I see you, fucker. He kept moving his jacket by his waist like he was flashing a weapon, but I couldn't see anything from inside. The cops get him down the road, and an officer came by and basically said the guy's homeless and not mentally stable. No shit. We told him everything that happened, and the cook pressed charges on him. The officer told us that there wasn't anything they could do, and he wouldn't give them his name, so they let him go. Basically, it ended with, Oh, by the way, he's known to carry a knife in his waistband. Call us if you need us. Bye. He came back again hauling ass across the neighborhood parking lot and back into the field. We could hear him screaming, yelling, Hey, come here, again and again. We got busy when the bars closed and haven't heard him yelling since, but I know he's still back there because I caught him sleeping behind the dumpster before. My manager comes in in the morning and I'm going to try to convince her to let me take a picture of him off of the security tapes so I can warn the other third shift workers. The field he's camping out in also backs up to a middle school, but the cops said, again, there was nothing they could do. Hopefully he moves on and leaves us alone, or the cops can get him on something where no one gets hurt. This happened a few years ago and still rattles me when I think about it. For context, I'm a female, and at the time I was around 25 years old. I worked in an office of around 150 people. One day I received an email from a co-worker, but I didn't recognize his name. The email basically said something along the lines of, I'm sorry if I did something to offend you. Given the situation, if you prefer never to see me again, I understand and will avoid you in the kitchen. I was extremely perplexed as I had no idea who this guy was, but I must have done something to offend this person, right? I responded back along the lines of, I'm so sorry if I offended you. Sometimes I zone out and it can be perceived as if I'm rude, so I apologize. After this response, he started getting irritated basically denying my apology and acting all passive-aggressive about it. I wish I kept a screenshot of these emails, but basically he was confusing the hell out of me with this misunderstanding. So I sent him a message suggesting we resolve this in person. Big mistake. He agrees to meet me in the kitchen in the office. I go there and immediately see a tall, 30-ish year old guy who I've seen around but never met before. I explained to him that I apologize, but I truthfully have no idea who he is, have never even met him before, and don't want any issues. What happens after made me very concerned. His face flushed bright red, and he looked visibly angry. He was stuttering and denying that I didn't know who he was, 
and then says, You've been staring at me for months. When you made eye contact with me, you gasped and ran away. Okay, what the fuck? I strongly denied this and told him it was a mistake, and he kept insisting that I've been staring at him for months and he could always see me doing it. Eventually, I realized he couldn't see reason and decided to end the conversation. Upon reflection, I realized that it's possible he thought I was staring at him because when you walk into the hallway next to the kitchen, there is a room with glass at the end where a bunch of desks are. His desk would be right in the line of sight if I was walking down the hallway, and he had a funny sticker on his desk I'd sometimes look at, but this seems like a huge stretch. After this incident, a co-worker pulls me over and asks me why I was talking to him. I explain the situation. She looked scared and told me that last year, he appeared in the office in bathrobe, raving like a madman at people, and he wasn't fired. Was I dealing with someone in the midst of psychosis? Was he dangerous? No clue, but I reported this ASAP to my manager, who took it seriously enough to tell his manager. I don't think he works there anymore. Thankfully, I left this company two weeks later, but I was extra cautious to not go anywhere near that guy. I encountered this on the 2nd of January when I was asleep in my room. I'm an 18-year-old female living in Singapore with my parents. In my family, it's only my mom, my stepdad, and myself living in a small apartment. I have my own bedroom as I'm an only child. My parents took the smaller room and I had the master bedroom, which has a big window that's facing the back of our house. For my bedroom, there's a big space outside of our window that's between every apartment unit over here, so there's no way someone would unintentionally stand near my window. You have to walk in and go for a few turns before coming here. I eventually fell asleep at around 11pm and I forgot to close my blackout curtains for my window. Even though it's a frosted window, anyone can see through it if they stood close enough to it for a closer look. Exactly at 1.23 a.m., I heard three loud knocks on my bedroom window, which eventually woke me up as I'm a very light sleeper. Where I'm sleeping, my window is on the right corner, and I can see whatever shadow that projects through it, day or night. On that night, the only light I had on was my table lamp that was facing me at its highest brightness. At first, I was sleeping while facing my room door so I had an automatic response to turn my head and look at what's knocking on my window. To my surprise, I saw a silhouette of a man's head that was clearly visible on my window. I had goosebumps. I froze because I was unsure of what to do as the curtains were wide open, so obviously that man's intention was to look at me through my window. Despite my parents' room being right next to mine, I went into shock and had to call my mom to help check if I was tripping and to also close the curtains for me. I told her what I saw afterwards. In the end, she advised me to sleep in the living room for the meantime to calm myself down. I felt really uneasy that night. I couldn't go back to sleep. Since I stayed awake that same night, I heard three more knocks coming from my bedroom at 3 a.m which of course I had to assume it came from the window. Before this happened, my curtains were already closed and blocking my window's view, so I thought that it would be fine for me to go ahead and get a little look on who or what knocked on my window. The only difference this time is that the knock was louder but slower, like the ones you would experience if you're in an old haunted house. Come to think of it now, I wish I stayed in my living room. I had my face and hand holding onto the window since I had to get a closer and clearer look, since I didn't see a silhouette when I was standing from a distance from the window, and me still being paranoid from what happened hours before. I saw a man who was around 180 plus meters standing outside of my window, about 4 meters apart, standing and staring right at me who's currently frozen in place at the window when I saw him. 
He was wearing long gray pants and a black t-shirt. He was really, really pale. It looked as if he had no expression when he saw me. By the time it happened, I wasn't really sure if it was the same man that stood outside at around 1.30 a.m. As tired as I was that night, I knew I wasn't hearing things or seeing hallucinations. I was perfectly wide awake when I saw that man. Moral of the story, always check your windows before going to bed, and it's best to get a blackout curtain to protect yourself. I am a psychiatrist, and during my training years, I worked for six months at a ward treating patients with depressive and anxiety disorders. It was an old building which had been housing psychiatric patients since the mid-1920s. On our floor, we had 13 beds and a nursing station, a living room, and a few conference rooms. One day, a few weeks in, I am interviewing a patient who, when asked about sleeping patterns, tells me she heard a baby crying at night, waking her up. There are no babies in that hospital, as the place is situated far away from housing areas, and there were restricted visiting hours. Afterwards, the nurse pulls me aside and tells me that the baby crying thing is not a psychotic symptom. She is very serious about this, but won't elaborate. I kind of shrug it off, as either way it does not change the diagnostic or treatment and I forget about the experience. Around three months into my stay, I sit in the nurse's station and three nurses behind me are talking. One of them says, she's very active today, and another responds with, really? Oh, I hadn't noticed. I turn around and ask them who they are talking about. They look at each other, and then one of them hesitantly says, well, there is a baby here. She cries sometimes. I of course say, no, but they just kind of shrug and smile. Not 30 seconds later, I hear it. It sounded far away, but not too far. A cry, clearly a baby's cry, sounding like it is separated from us by maybe two or three walls. I'm perplexed and look at the nurses. They look at me like, told you so. I of course ask about this, but they can't say anything else, but this faint baby cry is there, and has been there always. Since then, I heard it maybe two to three times a week. I told a new doctor about it who left. However, a few weeks into her stay, she came to me white as a sheet, and told me she heard it on her coffee break. All the nurses just kind of knew about it, and being in psychiatry, hearing that kind of stuff is not really something you brag about. I was transferred, and haven't heard it since. I think about it sometimes, but I don't really know what to make of it. For some context, I'm female, and this happened a couple of years back when I was around 26. This happened in a big city. I was out with my dog, a little chihuahua, heading to a vet appointment, but I was pretty anxious and focused on getting to the vet ASAP. I was wearing a mask because it was in the middle of the worst part of the pandemic, and I was wearing a t-shirt with my university on it. I suddenly lock eyes with a guy on the sidewalk, headed in the opposite direction, and he comes up to me while I was walking and says, You went to NYU? I said yes and he started to walk with me along the sidewalk, the opposite way he was headed. He was right by my side, explaining what a great school it is, and how he's in grad school there. Somehow I felt like this was very unlikely. He looked 30 plus, and didn't seem to know anything about the college, and didn't give any details. He starts asking me more questions, and at this point, I'm speed walking down the block, and he just keeps walking right next to me. My dog at this point is getting really antsy, and I'm incredibly uncomfortable, as I have no clue who this guy is, or why he's trying to walk with me on a busy sidewalk. Suddenly my dog starts to bark and growl at him aggressively, and he doesn't seem to care and just keeps walking with me. At this point, 
It's been like five to ten street blocks, with me trying to keep my dog from growling and barking, and him asking me questions. I tried to explain I'm going to a vet appointment, but I was nervous. Eventually, he says, can I see you without your mask? I legit flat out say no, to which his eyebrows go up like he's shocked. He keeps pushing, and I keep flatly telling him no. Then he tells me he wants me to go get coffee with him, and inviting me to go with him. I decline and tell him I have a boyfriend, and assured him I was getting engaged soon. My dog is still flipping an absolute shit, barking aggressively at him. But finally, after like ten streets, after he realized I'm taken, this guy departs and leaves me alone. Now, I know the most likely explanation is, guy thought I was pretty, wanted to ask me out on a date, and he was awkward. But holy shit, please do not follow a young woman down ten streets who you don't know. It was unnerving, and I still remember this years later. I guess he made an impression. When I was around 12, I lived with my mother in a granny flat. The flat was connected to the old person's house and was built by his son. The neighbor was called Harry. There were three ways to enter the yard, one being from Harry's backyard, one being by the driveway, and the other being the main entrance. The gate at the driveway was broken and we kept Harry's gate blocked. Harry was an odd guy, around 70 years old, and always gave me and my mom the creeps. But I remember one day, when me and my mom were outside, he started talking to us over the gate and got on what we later learnt was a step stool and my mom told me to go inside. Another time was when I was taking out the rubbish and when I turned around, he was behind me, just staring. I tried to leave, but he dragged me into a conversation and after a while, my mom showed up and asked what took so long. And when she saw Harry, she told me to go into the house, and when she came back, she told me that if he ever does that again, to run away. The third thing I remember is when I was home alone, and I heard the gate open, so I took a look outside, and I saw Harry walking around the yard. I ran into my mom's room and stayed quiet. After a while, I heard knocking, and the gate opened and shut, indicating that he left. The final issue was when me and my mom were mowing the lawn, when I felt I was being watched. I looked up, and there was Harry standing near his back door, just staring. After a minute, my mom realized I was staring at something and looked up. She immediately got mad, telling me to get inside and lock the door. My mom started yelling at him, saying, What are you doing? Go away. Leave us alone. If you keep this up, I'm calling the cops. I don't really remember what happened next, but after a few months, we moved, and it was the biggest relief ever. My mom told Harry's son what had happened after my mom yelled at him, and I'm guessing the son told his dad to leave us alone, but it was definitely creepy. To give context, I used to be a 911 dispatcher for a small city. We dispatched all law, fire, EMS for the entire county, and within this county were multiple law agencies. I had been there for about three months or so when I met him, Jake. Jake had recently transferred from a big department in California and landed himself randomly at our department. It didn't make much sense as to why he left California in the first place, but he always insisted it was just time for him to move to a smaller and less dangerous department. Him and I quickly became close and would chat almost every day after I got off shift. Within a few months, it became apparent that we liked each other and our flirting progressed into something more serious. Fast forward a few months later, and it turns out he was doing some inappropriate things to photos and videos of me whilst he was actively on duty. This, and a few other things he'd kept hidden on duty, led to him losing his license and leaving. During the process of his termination, 
His sergeant had suggested I get a protective order against him, as he'd made threatening statements previously towards me. Things such as, You better be telling the truth. I'll find out Tuesday if you're lying to me. I had begun to fill out the paperwork, and was told I had a temporary protective order on him in the meantime, but I don't think I ever did. About two weeks after his termination, he calls me to catch up. The entire call is like an old friend to an old friend. What am I doing for work? Do I have a boyfriend now? But progressively turns more personal. When does my shift end? What do I drive? Being 18 and naive, I treated him like I always had, answering his questions. I had contacted his old department afterwards, as his sergeant had told me to let him know if I was ever contacted again. But they turned me away pretty quickly and didn't want anything to do with it. With that, I blocked Jake. Roughly a month later, I get a call from a new number, and it's Jake. Once again, he wants to meet up and catch up. But this time, he so casually goes on to tell me about this new house he's wanting to buy in my neighborhood, knowing it's my neighborhood. I had never told him where I lived in town, let alone what specific neighborhood. During this call, he progressively got more aggressive as well, making statements such as, If I knew I was going to get canned, I should have just had my way with you. He half-heartedly joked about getting a hotel room just for me, and that was that. A few days later, he FaceTimed me, and once again came off as simply wanting to catch up as he was sick. Midway through our seemingly normal conversation, he makes it apparent he's been touching himself this entire time. Keep in mind, nothing suggestive was mentioned, and our conversation at that point was about his new dog. He's blocked once again, but has tried to follow my social media, and now I've started to see him in my area. Last I knew, he lived nearly 30 to 45 minutes in the opposite direction from me. Am I reading too much into this? Or should I genuinely consider this stalking? I hope you enjoyed that, guys. I want to give a special mention to Jay Nightmares for sourcing and translating some of these stories from Japanese. Check out his channel for more stories you haven't heard before. I'll put the link to his channel in the description. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Lavina Cordelia, Kirby Harris, Angie Lindo, Rebecca James, Mason Hayes, Chelsea Moffat, Lisa Prentice, Michelle and Kevin, Amanda M, Rebecca Morris, Jennifer, Jessica Lasley, Brock Bollard, Kim Thompson, Angela Reeves, Sherry Agbehi, Nathan Shadwick, Nicholas Johnson, Samantha Place, Cheryl Duckworth, Scoutmonk405, Z Harris, Unladylike 13, Ventura CA, Elizabeth Mares, Alexia Tuttle, Marshana Rainey, Yolo Sapien, Mary Wright, Jessica Copperfield, Zoe D, Danielle Scholl, Jane Wiggins, Tara Harris, Mary Wright, Kelly Townsend, M, Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Love, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Madiza Felter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdowski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tierra Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, 
Maribel de Luna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Coro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Cami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Plays 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasps Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lily Pan, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Lainey, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanitix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Draco, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Cow, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well guys. I'll see you all on the next one.